pick up with the second portion of chapter 19 and let's get started. All right, so we stopped off talking about basically the uh, structure, functions, and different types of arteries, capillaries, and veins. So let's pick up and continue on with this chapter. So this chapter is going to talk about the physiology of how blood is going to circulate through our blood vessels. So we'll start off by talking about flow, pressure, and resistance. So some definitions of terms that we want to commit to memory. Blood flow, this is the volume of blood flowing through a vessel, an organ, or an entire cir 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 circulation at a given period. Um, this is gonna be measured in milliliters per minute, and it is equivalent to the cardiac output. Overall, blood flow is gonna be relatively constant when we are at rest, pretty much just doing day-to-day, -day, sitting down at your desk, watching TV, um, not doing too much exertive movement. But at any given moment, the blood flow will vary in individual organs at different times based on what our bodies need. Blood pressure is going to be the force per unit of area exerted on a wall of a blood vessel by blood itself. We measured this in millimeters per mercury. It's measured as a systemic arterial blood pressure in large arteries near the heart because once again, arteries have high blood pressure. And so when we're measuring blood pressure, we're going to want to take it from one of our largest arteries that's closest to the heart to see how hard the heart is working and pumping blood throughout our bodies. Um, the pressure gradient provides a driving force that keeps blood moving from higher to lower pressure areas. Because just like diffusion, molecules like to move from an area of high concentration to low, pressure likes to move from an area of high pressure to low pressure. And then we have resistance or peripheral resistance, which is the opposition to flow or blood flow. This measurement, this measurement will measure the amount of friction blood encounters with vessel walls. So what do you think we want? Do we want this resistance pressure to be lower or higher? And of course, you want this, re, the, this resistance to be lower. We don't want a lot of friction flowing or we don't want blood flowing through a lot of friction as it's flowing through our blood vessels. Three important sources of resistance will be blood viscosity, the thickness of blood, total blood vessel length, and then a blood vessel diameter. So like I said, with blood vis viscosity, this is going to be the thickness or stickiness of blood due to formed elements in plasma. So the greater viscosity, the less easily molecules are able to slide past each other. So we don't want blood to have a, a high viscosity. Total blood vessel length, the longer the vessel, the greater the resistance encounter. And then blood vessel, blood vessel size um, has the greatest influence on resistance. Frequent changes will alter the peripheral resistance. So viscosity and blood vessel length are relatively constant. It's usually the blood vessel size or the changes in the size of the blood vessel that will directly impact blood resistance. So fluid close to walls moves more slowly than fluid in the middle of the tube, which we call laminar flow. And resistance will vary inversely with fourth power of vessel radius. So for instance, if the radius of our blood vessel will increase, then resistance will decrease, allowing for faster blood flow and vice versa. Okay, um, small arterioles are going to be major determinants of resistance. The radius will change frequently in contrast to larger arteries that do not change often. So basically what we're saying is that smaller arteries arterioles are going to have greater resistance, which makes sense because like we said before, the arterioles, especially the terminal ones, are going to control and regulate how much blood is going to flow into the capillary beds. So we actually want these arterioles to have the ability to enforce greater resistance on blood versus blood flowing through our elastic arteries. We want that blood flow to be continuous. We want it to be um, pretty low resistance so that blood can flow through pretty often and pretty, I don't want to say quickly, but continuous so that we don't have resistance flowing from the heart into these larger structures. Abrupt changes in vessel size or obstacles such as fatty plaques 
from atherosclerosis will dramatically increase the resistance. And so the, the laminar flow can be disrupted and become a turbulent flow, which is basically an, an irregular flow that will cause increased resistance, further slowing blood flow through that particular area. So for instance, we have an example of a milkshake and two different straws. Which straw is gonna allow for you to get the milkshake easier, which would have less resistance? Obviously, the one that has a larger size versus the skinny, um, this skinny larger straw. So let me go back. This particular straw is shorter, has a larger size to it. It'll be easier for us to get this milkshake from the container into our mouths versus this straw is longer and it's thinner in size. So it's gonna be quite hard or it, it will have more resistance or it will incur more resistance in you trying to get that milkshake out of your cup. In terms of the relationship of blood flow, blood pressure and blood resistance, blood flow is gonna be directly proportional to blood pressure gradient blood flow will be inversely proportional to peripheral resistance. So in essence, if the resistance, I mean, sorry, so re resistance is more important in influencing the local blood flow because it is easily changed by altering the blood vessel size. I'm not gonna require you to perform any of this math on the exam, but I do want you to understand the relationship of blood flow, blood pressure, and blood resistance. Okay, moving on to systemic blood pressure. So pumping action of the heart will generate a blood flow. As the heart pumps, it's gonna allow blood to flow through the systemic circuit, the circulation of blood throughout our bodies. So pressure results when flow is opposed by resistance. So anytime blood is going to encounter an area of resistance, that is what's going to determine or assist in, de in determining our blood pressure. Systemic pressure is highest at the aorta, the largest artery that we have in our bodies that's directly connected to the heart. And then blood pressure will decline as blood flows through the systemic circuit, and especially when it gets into the pulmon back into the venous circulation. Um, blood pressure or systemic pressure will be steepest. The steepest drop will occur at our arterial. So blood pressure will be pretty high as blood is flowing through those elastic arteries, muscular arteries, and then when we get into the arterioles, that's when our blood pressure will drastically drop. And we can see that here. So blood's flowing from the heart into the aorta, high blood pressure through our arteries, high blood pressure. And then we start to see the decline of blood pressure as we are going from our arteries into our arterioles. And then we see this steep drop of blood pressure when we get to like those terminal arterioles entering into the capillaries and blood, blood pressure just continues to drop as we're going from venules, veins, and then back into the vena cava, which is the largest vein that we have in our body. So arterial blood pressure is going to be determined by two factors, elasticity or the compliance of arteries close to the heart, the ability of them to um, and it, to expand and relax comfortably and easily, um, and also the volume of blood force through them at, at any given time. Blood pressure near the heart is going, excuse me, to rise and fall with each heartbeat, which is going to allow for us to have a pulse. That's what we are feeling when we take our pulse. Systolic pressure is gonna be pressure exerted in the aorta during a ventricular contraction. So when the ventricles contract, the systolic pressure that we're getting is going to be the pressure exerted on that large artery um, as blood is flowing through it. The left ventricle more specifically is gonna pump blood through the aorta impairing or imparting kinetic energy that will then stretch this structure. So for an average adult, blood pressure, or, or I should say the systolic blood pressure should be around 120. That's what we call normal. Um, di di diastolic pressure, excuse me, is gonna be the lowest level of pressure through the a aorta when the heart is at rest. Uh, pulse pressure will, that is gonna be the difference between the contraction and relaxation that occurs in the heart. And our pulse is gonna be the throbbing of arteries due to a difference in pulse pressures, which can be felt under the skin. 
So the mean arterial pressure or MAP is going to be a pressure that propels blood to tissues and the pulse pressure phases out near the end of the arterial tree. Um, when the heart spends more time in relaxation, um, I'm sorry, the heart spends more time in relaxation, so not to just a simple average contraction and relaxation. Simply saying that the heart's gonna spend more time relaxing as to not overworking. So when we're looking at, and we'll talk more about this in the next chapter, when, when we're looking at the cardiac cycle and we're looking at the phases of contraction and relaxation of the heart, the heart's not just contracting, contracting, relaxing. There's going to be a little bit more time of the heart spending in this phase of relaxation to kind or to ensure that the heart does not overwork, over pump itself. So if we were to calculate MAP, which is the mean arterial pressure, this is going to be adding the dot diastolic pressure plus one third of the pulse pressure. So if your blood pressure was 120 over 80, the pulse pressure would be 120 minus 80, which would be 40. So the MAP would be the mean arterial pressure would be 80 plus one third times 40, which will equal then roughly around 93. Once again, I'm not gonna have you to uh, calculate any of these equations. I mostly just want you to know what these terms mean and how they affect the body. Both the pulse pressure and the MAP will decline with increasing distance from the heart. Okay, so clinical monitoring of how well our blood is circulating through our body is going to occur by allowing us to perform vital signs and taking and taking those vital um, signs. So vital signs are going to include pulse and pre blood pressure, along with your respiratory rate and body temperature. So anytime we go to the doctor, whether we are sick or whether we are healthy, you're gonna have your pulse taken, they're gonna take your blood pressure, take your temperature, and listen to your heart. Hands down, they do it all the time. And if they don't, you do not wanna go back there again. So of course, when taking the pulse, we're gonna take the radial pulse. Um, which is going to be taken at the wrist. This is the most routine, the most routinely used pulse point, um, but there are obviously other areas of the body where we can get a pulse reading. You can get it right here, you can get it on the palm or the bottom of your foot, depending on what's going on with the person, maybe what's happened to them and so on. Pressure points are areas where arteries are close to the body surface. So if we were to compress these areas, we can stop blood flow even if a person is bleeding out. And I'm sure um, you've seen that, you know, through movies where someone is like, all right, let's tie something and, you know, cut off blood flow so that per so a person doesn't bleed out. The area where they're tying, the tourniquets or what have you, are going to be those pressure points. So here we have an air, a diagram showing us the body sites where a pulse is most easily felt and, palp and palpated. Um, nothing that I'm gonna have you memorize, but this definitely will be helpful for you to know, especially if you know that you wanna get into the medical field. This more specifically a nurse um, or a physician, you definitely wanna know these different areas. So in terms of measuring blood pressure, the systemic arterial blood pressure is measured indirectly by osculating methods um, using a sphygmometer. Say that three times, <laughs> really fast. So what are we doing here? We're gonna wrap a cuff around the arm superior to the elbow. So wrap a cuff around here. Increase pressure in the cuff until it, until it exceeds the systolic pressure in the brachial artery which is going to be the artery that we have here. And then pressure is slowly released and the examiner listens for sounds of um, the heart beating through a stethoscope. So essentially, the systolic pressure normally is going to be less than 120. We don't want it to exceed 120 because then that, that could be a sign that the heart is beating too, it's, over, it's being overworked. Um, so the systolic pressure is going to be the pressure when after, as you're listening to um, or you're listening through the, through the stethoscope, it's going to be the pressure when sounds first occur as blood starts to spurt through the artery. So you pump the cuff with air and then you slowly will release the air and that first 
sound that you hear is going to be the systolic pressure. So whatever the reading is when you hear the first sound, that's how that will be your systolic pressure. The diastolic pressure is going to be normally less than 80 or at 80 or less. This is that second sound, or I'm sorry, when that is the pressure when sound disappears because the artery is no longer constricted and blood is flowing freely. So as you're listening through the, the stethoscope, the first sound that you hear is the systolic pressure. Diastolic pressure will then be when you don't hear any sound at all because blood is flowing through that artery and it's not constricted anymore. When taking blood pressure and understanding blood pressure, what's most concerning when blood pressures are higher it's more so that diastolic pressure because that diastolic pressure is going to be more, di more directly related to how hard that left ventricle is working. And we'll talk about it a little bit more when we get to chapter 20, but we do not want the diastolic pressure to be so high because that directly implies that our left ventricle is pumping too hard. And of course, if our, if our heart is being overworked, it can wear out quickly. So obviously, when you're taking someone's blood pressure or when the doctor says, you know, your blood pressure is too high, we might need to put you on a medication. What they're saying is that your heart is overworking due to some situation or some issue. And the longer we allow for your heart to overwork, the more um, this is going to be harmful to you because the heart is a muscle. If it overworks, it could eventually stop working, which is what we don't want to happen. In terms of your capillary blood pressure, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but this ranges from 35 at the beginning of the capillary bed to about 17 at the end of the capillary bed. The low capillary pressure is desirable because high blood pressure would rupture the very delicate structures of the capillaries. So because these capillaries are so thin, we want a lower blood flow or blood pressure through the area. And then also, low pressure allows um, or will force the filtrate into the interstitial spaces. So this will then give the um, substances in blood time to diffuse into our tissues. Venous blood pressure is going to change very little during the cardiac cycle because venous blood pressure is low. <laughs> so it has a small pressure gradient, only about 15 if we were to take a reading of um, our veins. This is also why we don't use a vein to determine our blood pressure. If a vein is cut, the low pressure of the venous system will cause blood to flow out smoothly. If an artery is cut, though, because arteries do contain very high blood pressures, blood will spurt out because the pressure is higher. So if you've ever seen a movie where someone's cut right here and blood is like squirting out, they have cut an artery. Versus if you were to cut a vein, blood is going to flow out much more smoothly, less forcefully, because the pressure is lower. Okay, factors that will aid in venous return. So what is going to help blood flow up and against gravity through veins and back into the heart? Because that's what we want. First of all, we have our muscular pump, the heart. Um, I'm sorry, the muscular pump is going to be our skeletal muscles. So the contraction of our skeletal muscles kind of milks the blood back toward the heart. It also, we also have valves that will prevent backflow. So the muscular pump is going to be our skeletal muscles. And each time they contract, they help to milk and force blood back to the heart. And then, of course, the valves that we find in the veins will close and keep blood flowing in one direction. The respiratory pump is going to be the pressure changes during breathing and then um, which will cause blood to move toward the heart by squeezing the abdominal veins as the thoracic veins expand. So as we inhale with every breath that we take and we inhale, that's going to move blood to the heart because we'll squeeze our abdominal veins as the thoracic veins expand. So we take an inhale, abdominal veins will then squeeze, thoracic veins open up, and that helps to propel blood back to the heart. And then we have the sympathetic venoconstriction. So whenever the sympathetic nervous system is under control, um, it will allow for smooth muscles to constrict, which will then push blood back to the heart. So here we, we have an example of our muscular pump working. So as skeletal muscles contract, that will then put pressure on the valve and push blood up. So as the part of the vein contracts, that then propels blood back to the heart. 
Okay, so regulation of blood pressure. How do we maintain blood pressure within our bodies? So maintaining blood pressure requires cooperation of the heart, blood vessels, and our kidneys. And we'll talk more about the kidneys when we get to that particular system, but we'll start addressing it here. So all of these structures are gonna be supervised by the heart, by the brain. So the brain is gonna supervise and monitor blood pressure to the heart or through the heart, the blood vessels, and the kidneys. Three main factors that are going to be involved in regulating blood pressure will be our cardiac output, which we will talk about more in chapter 20, the peripheral resistance, and then blood volume. Blood pressure will vary directly with the cardiac output, blood resistance, I mean blood volume, and peripheral resistance. Okay, so remember, if we're going back to all these calculations, that essentially, Whenever we have a change in the peripheral resistance, that's going to directly determine and affect our blood pressure. That's, I'm summing up <laughs> this slide here. <laughs> so um, anything that will increase the uh, stroke volume, so remember, we talked about this a little bit before, car cardiac output is going to be calculated by the stroke volume plus the heart rate. So if the mean arterial pressure is equivalent to the cardiac output and resistance, then the mean arterial pressure is, is equivalent to stroke volume times heart rate times resistance. So anything that will increase the stroke volume, the amount of blood flowing through the ventricles or pumped by the ventricles, anything that will increase the heart rate, or anything that will increase the resistance will also increase the mean arterial pressure, which makes sense. Um, the stroke volume is going to be affected by the Rhenish return, the heart rate will be maintained by the medullary centers of our brain, and then resistance is affected mostly by vessel diameter. So factors that can affect our blood pressure can be short-term, and what we mean by short-term, meaning that, for instance, if I decide to run, um, of course, if I'm running and I'm running for an extended period of time, my blood is going to, my, my blood vessels will dilate so more blood can flow through so that I can um, continue to run. Um, so that would be an example of a short-term control mechanism. And that will be controlled by the nervous system, our brain, brain and spinal cord. Another example of a short-term one could be hormones. And then in terms of long-term maintenance of our blood pressure, that's going to be controlled by the kidneys or renal controls. Here's a diagram just showing us the major factors that will increase our mean arterial pressure or our MAP. So stroke volume and heart rate are going to be directly involved in the cardiac output, which will then affect and increase the mean arterial pressure. And then the total peripheral resistance is going to be affected by um, decreasing the diameter of our blood vessels, increasing blood viscosity or increasing blood vessel length, and of course cardiac output or changes in the cardiac output times changes in the resistance are all going to affect and increase and change the mean arterial pressure. So I'm not going to go through in detail of the regulations of each one of these controls. Um, and we'll just kind of run through them because I'm not going to test you in detail on these sections, but just to give you a little bit more information about them, um, I'll just summarize them real quick. So with the neural controls, there's two main neural mechanisms, mechanisms that will control the resistance. So we have the mean arterial pressure is going to be maintained by altering blood vessel diameter, and then we can also alter blood distribution to organs. So some neural controls that will operate through a reflex arc involves in the cardiovascular centers of the medulla, baroreceptors, remember these are receptors that are going to determine pressure changes in the body, more specifically blood pressure changes in the body. Chemoreceptors are going to, de are going to detect chemical changes that would occur in our um, bodies that would affect blood pressure, and then higher brain centers. Okay, and like I said, I'm not gonna go into each one of these, so if you wanna go into them on your own, that's fine, but I simply just want you to know in general, these are the neural controls that are going to assist in 
having short-term effects on blood pressure. Okay. In terms of hormones, we have the adrenal medulla hormones, so epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenal medulla gland will increase the cardiac output and then will increase vasoconstriction so that we can have so that we can accommodate a fight or flight response when needed. Angiotensin II will stimulate vasoconstriction, which will then increase resistance um, and have an increase in blood pressure. ADH, remember this is a hormone that is going to in high amounts cause vasoconstriction. And then the atrial natriuretic peptides will decrease blood pressure by antagonizing aldosterone. Remember, aldosterone is going to be a hormone that will then increase blood pressure, but AMPs will decrease blood pressure, um, which will also cause a decrease in blood volume. And then in terms of the renal regulation, we'll talk more about this when we get to the urinary system, so we'll just summarize it here. We have baroreceptors that will quickly adapt to chronic high or low blood pressure. Um, so the long-term mechanisms of blood pressure are really going to be by altering blood volumes through the kidneys. And so the kidneys will regulate arterial blood pressure by direct renal mechanisms or an indirect renal mechanism. So directly, we can alter blood volume independently of hormones. Um, by doing a couple of things. So increased blood pressure or blood volume will cause us to eliminate through urine more, which will help to decrease our blood pressure. Also, and just the reverse, if we have a decrease in blood pressure or blood volume, this will cause kidneys to conserve water so our, that our blood pressure will rise. So that's an example of how the body will, or how the kidneys will directly control um, blood pressure. The indirect method is going to be the renin, angiotensin aldosterone mechanism where decreased blood pressure causes the release of an enzyme called renin from the kidneys. Renin will then enter the blood and will catalyze a conversion of angiotens angiotensinogen from the liver to a component called angiotensin 1. Then angiotensin 1 will be converted to angiotensin 2. And then angiotensin 2 will act in four ways to stabilize blood pressure by stimulating aldosterone secretion. It will cause ADH to release from the, post, from the posterior pituitary gland. It will trigger the hypothalamic thirst center so that we can drink more water. And then it will act as a potent vasoconstrictor that will directly increase blood pressure. Do I want you to know this in detail? Absolutely not. What I want you to know from the indirect mechanism is that through the functions of renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, we can use these components indirectly to all work together to increase blood pressure. And like I said, because we talk about that in more detail when we get to the urinary system, I'm not gonna go into a whole bunch of detail in this chapter. So in terms of summarizing the blood pressure regulation, the goal of blood pressure control is to keep blood pressure high enough to provide adequate tissue perfusion or flow of blood through tissues, but not so high that blood vessels are damaged. So for example, if blood pressure to the brain is too low, the perfusion is inadequate, the diffusion of blood flow through our vessels, and a person will lose consciousness versus if blood pressure to the brain is too high, a person could have a stroke neither of which what we want to happen. And this diagram pro provides us a summary of factors that will all work together to increase mean arterial pressure. Okay, so regulation of blood pressure, um, or I should more should talk about imbalances of regulating blood pressure. Um, so we have transient elevations in blood pressure that can occur during changes in posture, physical exertion, emotional upset, or fever. Age, sex, weight, race, mood, and posture may also affect our blood pressure and cause it to vary. Hypertension, most of us are pretty familiar with this. This occurs when our blood pressure is around 140 over 90 or higher, and it's at this for a sustained period of time. So not, you know, I go to the dentist and I'm, I always get anxious when I go to the dentist, they take my blood pressure and it's high, no. Over an extended period of time, no matter what the situation is, my blood pressure from rest to being anxious is always gonna be at 140 over 90 or higher. 
Prehypertension occurs if values are elevated, but not yet in a hypertension rate. So your doctor might say, hey, you're at a predisposition to maybe having high blood pressure, but we're gonna monitor it. They might tell you some things to, to work on to try to get it out of that range. Um, so prolonged hypertension is a major cause of heart failure, vascular disease, renal failure, and stroke. And this is all because the heart is working much harder than it needs to consistently for a prolonged period of time. And so when the heart is overworked, the myocardium or the muscular layer of the heart becomes enlarged. And even though the muscle comes enlarged, it actually weakens because it's too large and the heart ends up becoming flabby. So if you think about it, if muscle is flabby, it's not contracting as it should because it's weaker, which means now my heart's enlarged, it's not pumping efficiently. I have less blood flowing through my heart, which means I have less oxygen, nutrients, which is gonna cause all types of complications. Also, this will accelerate the development of plaque through our blood vessels leading to atherosclerosis. Primary hypertension is relatively what 90% of people have when they have hypertensive conditions. There's no underlying cause identified. Risk factors include heredity, diet, obesity, rage, diabetes, stress, and smoking. At this point in time, we don't have a cure, but we can control primary hypertension by restricting salt, fat, and our cholesterol intake. We can also increase exercise, lose weight, and stop smoking, and then of course take medication. Secondary hypertension is much less common. This is due to identifiable disorders, including obstructed renal arteries, kidney disorders, and an endocrine disorder such as hyperthyroidism and Cushing's syndromes. Treatment will focus on correcting the underlying cause, which will then hopefully correct secondary hypertension. Hypotension is just the opposite. This occurs when our blood pressure is very low, which is going to consistently be at 90 over 60. It's usually not a concern unless it causes inadequate blood flow to tissues, and it's often associated with long life and lack of cardiovascular illness. Um, though there can be some concern with it, so orthostatic hypotension is a temporary low blood pressure, and it, we experience some dizzy spells when suddenly rising from sitting or reclining to a position. So if I stand real quick and then I'm like, whoa, whew, very dizzy, um, this could be a temporarily low blood pressure. Chronic hypotension is a hint of poor nutrition and a warning sign for a development of a disease called Addison's um, or hypothyroidism. And then acute hypotension is an important sign of, cir of cir circulatory shock um, which we do not want. We don't want the shock and the circulation of our body to where it would potentially inhibit blood flow. So this is a condition where blood vessels will inadequately fill and cannot circulate blood normally, and inadequate blood flow cannot meet tissue needs. We don't have oxygen. We don't have our nutrients. We don't have you taking out CO2, which is a waste product that our cells make. Hypovolemic shock results from large-scale blood loss. Vascular shock Shock will result from extreme vasodilation and decreased per peripheral resistance. So we're just basically allowing too much blood to be flowing through and we have no resistance at all to inhibit blood flow. And cardiogenic shock results when an inefficient heart cannot sustain adequate circulation. So for those particular um, imbalances, I just want you to know what they are and how they affect the body. And um, this, is at, this is the end of part two. We've got one more part to this chapter. This chapter is pretty long, um, but, this, but the next video will be pretty short. So you can stop watching this video and click on to the next one.